Discover the chilling tale of Sherry Miller, whose deceitful online affairs led to a gruesome end for her husband. In the most nightmarish end to a marriage, the case of Sherry Miller, true crime documentary, unravels the web of lies, betrayal, and murder that shocked a community. Tune in for a gripping true crime saga that explores the dark side of relationships in the digital age. Falsely portraying her spouse as violent, the internet black widow persuaded her boyfriend from Kansas City, Missouri, to go to Michigan and murder her husband. Paulette, the sherry in the end, Kitley Miller's deceitful actions led her online partner, Jerry Cassidy, to assassinate Bruce Miller. Cassidy didn't know Bruce personally, instead she just trusted Sherry's stories. Sherry and Bruce were residents of Flint, Michigan. Bruce, a 47-year-old company owner, ran B&D Auto Salvage. When Bruce first recruited her as his bookkeeper, Sherry was a 26-year-old single mother of three who had a background in abusive relationships. Even though 1999 was less than 20 years ago, technologically speaking, it was a quite different world. Cell phones were considered luxuries, laptops were uncommon, and most people surfed the web on bulky home PCs that had enormous black towers connected to enormous monitors by an intricate network of wires and cables. There was no such thing as social media, and texting was not commonplace. Rather, they conversed with one another in internet chat rooms. Some of them were adult-oriented. You could go there to engage in virtual romances, express your desires, and flirt in private. Occasionally, they would result in meetings and relationships in person. According to Killer Affair and Snap on Oxygen, Sherry Miller met Jerry Cassidy in one of these chat rooms. She would go on to have an affair with him and ultimately persuade him to kill her husband, Bruce. The hardscrabble blue-collar town of Flint, Michigan, where Bruce and Sherry Miller resided, was formerly a crucial component of the Midwest's car manufacturing sector. Sherry had grown up in a trailer park and had been on her own since the age of 16, but Bruce was a well-known and prosperous business owner. It first got together in 1997 when she started working as the bookkeeper for Bruce's business, B&D Auto Salvage. She was a 26-year-old single mother of three who had experienced abuse in the past, and he was 47. Even though the couple was 20 years apart in age, things happened quickly for them. From courting to living together to marriage, everything happened fast. She always said Bruce was the best thing that ever happened to her. Chuck Noller, Bruce's brother, stated on Oxygen's SNAPPED program. She was finally living a regular life, was not being transferred around, and was in a relationship with a financially secure man. Bruce was blindsided by the attractive young blonde, whom he believed to be the perfect wife, according to Chuck's wife, Judy. But friends started to have some doubts about Sherry. They felt she maxed up credit cards and spent excessive amounts of money too quickly, something she wouldn't have done if her husband hadn't worked so hard to support her. However, Bruce didn't appear to mind, and Sherry was employed as well. She could sell directly to customers at home or on the road because she worked as a sales representative for Mary Kay Cosmetics. Her spouse even got her a computer so she could monitor her accounts. Sherry Miller was using her home computer to look out for vacation spots for a trip with one of her buddies when she happened upon adult chat rooms by accident. She quickly developed a routine of regularly checking in and disclosing her most intimate dreams to total strangers while using a range of seductive screen names, such as Horny7241, Love Me Slowly, and IWANT2BELAID. Snap was informed by Detective Kevin Shanlian, who looked into the murder of Bruce Miller, that she went by at least 25 different names. Jerry Cassidy, also known as R-E-N-O-B-U-D-E-S on the internet, was one of the individuals Sherry Miller made acquaintance with. Cassidy was a pit boss at Harris Casino in Reno, Nevada. He was a former police officer from Kansas City, Missouri. Dave Line NBC was able to get court documents that indicated he had a history of substance addiction and despair. Jerry and Sherry first met in person when they were vacationing in Reno in July 1999. Sherry went there with her friend. According to his friend and co-worker Carol Swatter, who appeared in Snap, Sherry entered Jerry's life at a difficult time. His marriage was ending, and he had moved to a new place without any friends. Cassidy confessed to Slaughter that he would do anything in the bedroom, after falling deeply in love with the homemaker. Sherry soon started going to Reno for amorous liaisons with Cassidy over the summer and fall of that year, using her cosmetics business as a front. Sherry and Jerry used to send and receive graphic emails and instant conversations, including videos of Sherry masturbating when they weren't together in Reno. Then she started telling him wild stories about her childhood in Michigan. 
She claimed that her spouse was a mafia member who had beaten and sexually assaulted her on several occasions. She revealed to Jerry that she was carrying his child and even showed him a sonogram, but she miscarried as a result of being beaten by her spouse. Sherry underwent a tubal ligation treatment in 1995, following which she lost her ability to conceive. Sherry eventually started discussing killing her husband Bruce with Cassidy. Bruce Miller didn't know anything was wrong back in Flint. He came to accept her pension for online flirting, the many hours she spent on her computer, and her business trips away from home, even though he knew she liked to do so. As far as family and friends were concerned, the Millers seemed to be a happy and loving couple, and he was proceeding with his preparations to adopt her children. When Bruce Miller didn't arrive home from work on November 8, 1999, Sherry became concerned. She requested his brother Chuck to drive out to B and D Auto Salvage so she could check on him over the phone. Chuck found his brother dead on the floor when he arrived. He had been shot at close range in the chest with a shotgun. Witnesses said that Sherry started crying and screaming when she found out about Bruce's passing. Given that Bruce was known to carry a lot of cash, the authorities initially believed that his death might have been the result of an attempted robbery. In addition, Miller and one of his employees, who was once suspected of killing him, were being probed for tampering with vehicle identification numbers at B&D, according to court filings. But neither approach yielded any leads, and the situation quickly became unsolvable. Meanwhile, Sherry's actions didn't gel with most people's notion of a grieving spouse. As her sister-in-law, Judy Miller, put it, Detective Shanlian said to Snap that witnesses claimed to have seen the woman dancing in a bar in Ottisville, Michigan, committing sex acts on the floor two days after the death, the murder of her husband that she loved. Sherry moved her new partner into the home she had previously lived with her husband one month after Bruce Miller was killed. That new boyfriend turned out to be Jeff Foster, a neighborhood delivery guy, rather than Jerry Cassidy. Nevertheless, Shanlian claims that Sherry's alibi was rock solid, meaning that she was never considered a suspect in Miller's death. Back in the Midwest at the time of Bruce Miller's murder was Jerry Cassidy. He had lost custody of his son and been arrested twice in Reno. So that fall, he had returned home to the Kansas City region to clean up. It has been stated that Sherry Miller ended her connection with Cassidy shortly after Bruce Miller was killed. On February 11, 2000, three months later, he shot himself to death inside his Odessa, Missouri apartment using a 22 rifle. After Cassidy passed away, his brother Mike discovered a briefcase with a suicide note inside, in which Jerry admitted to killing Bruce Miller. I killed him there while driving. He wrote, Sherry was involved and helped set it up. He would exact retribution on the woman who betrayed him in the hereafter. I am sending the police all of the proof that I possess. She will receive what's coming, he wrote in his letter. He submitted printed transcripts of his instant messages with Sherry to support his claims. Between explicit sexual scenes, Sherry provided Jerry with important information such as where to park discreetly, how to locate B&D auto salvage and other details that according to lead investigator Detective Oz Potravka, serve as a plan for the entire murder. The Cassidy family's attorneys promptly forwarded their information to the Genesee County Sheriff's Department. Sherry Miller and her boyfriend Jeff Foster were met by the police as soon as they got off an airplane on February 22, 2000. Paradoxically, they were coming back from a leisurely vacation to Reno. She was accused of plotting to commit murder and second-degree murder. She insisted to her deceased husband's relatives that she was innocent despite a briefcase full of proof. She called my mother and assured her that they would sort this mess out, Chuck Miller said and snapped. A jury found her guilty and gave her a life sentence in two days. Sherry Miller's case was among the first to combine sex, murder, and the internet. There were stories of lewd adult chat rooms, recordings of people masturbating, and emails that included incriminating information. The 2006 Lifetime made-for-TV film, Fatal Desire, starring Anne Hesh and Eric Roberts, was influenced by it. Several television programs have featured the case, including Dateline NBC, Snap on Oxygen, American Justice on A&E, and Deadly Women on Investigation Discovery. Cassidy's suicide letter was deemed inadmissible as evidence by a federal court judge, leading to the overturning of Sherry Miller's conviction in August 2008. She was released on bond on July 29, 2009, and a new trial date was scheduled. Miller's conviction was upheld in August 2012, following several years of back and forth in Michigan's appeal courts, and she was taken back into custody in the same year. Sherry Miller eventually came clean in April 2016 after a 17-year period, 
during which she maintained her innocence and clawed the courts with her appeals. Bruce Miller was described by Miller as a great man and the only man who loved me for me. Miller acknowledged her guilt and acknowledged using sex and lies to trick Jerry Cassidy into killing Bruce Miller in a four-page typed letter that she sent to both Genesee Circuit Judge Judith A. Fullerton and Genesee County Prosecutor David Layden. As the shocking truth unfolds, don't miss a moment of the case of Sherry Miller. Subscribe now for more true crime stories that will keep you on the edge of your seat.